President Obama has officially signed legislation to increase the U.S. debt ceiling in time to avoid a national default. The $2.1 trillion deficit reduction plan cleared its final hurdle in the Senate yesterday, passing with a 74 to 26 vote. Six Democrats and 19 Republicans opposed the measure. The bill's signing came roughly 10 hours before the deadline for Washington to raise its borrowing limit. The deal includes no new tax revenue from wealthy Americans and no additional stimulus for the lagging economy. It includes a provision to create a joint committee of 12 legislators charged with finding $1.5 trillion in deficit cuts. The committee must hold its first meeting in 45 days and is expected to set in motion a lobbying frenzy. President Obama welcomed the deal as an important first step and urged both parties to work together on a larger plan to cut the deficit. Both parties share power in Washington. And both parties need to take responsibility for improving this economy. It's not a Democratic responsibility or a Republican responsibility. It is our collective responsibility as Americans. This is, however, just the first step. This compromise requires that both parties work together on a larger plan to cut the deficit, which is important for the long-term health of our economy. And since you can't close the deficit with just spending cuts, We'll need a balanced approach, where everything's on the table. Yesterday, students and union activists in New York invaded Wall Street to protest the plan. They blamed big banks for contributing to the nation's trillion-dollar deficit and criticized President Obama for not paying attention to unemployment. Larry Hales was among those protesting. The general sentiment here is that we think a people's movement is needed to fight back so we can take control of the things that affect our lives, every level of government. I think that a lot of people can agree that that's the type of movement that you need in this country, because obviously they don't, aren't listening. They're listening more to Wall Street than they are the people. They know people are suffering. They know there's massive unemployment, but they don't care. Many in Congress share the protesters' concerns about the new debt deal. Members of the Progressive Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus rejected the deal because of its massive cuts to domestic spending and lack of tax increases for the wealthy. Among them, Democratic Congress member Donna Edwards of Maryland. She summed up her disappointment on Twitter, writing, Not a for million billionaires, corp tax loopholes aplenty, only sacrifice from the poor middle class, shared sacrifice, balance. Really? Well, for more on the debt deal, we go to Congressmember Donna Edwards, who's joining us from the rotunda of the Russell Senate Office Building in Washington, D.C. We're also joined there by economist Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, who's been closely following the deal. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Congressmember Edwards, you voted against this deal. Talk about what it means, what it will do and what it won't do. Well, I mean, there are a couple of things. Number one, you know, um, contrary to what's been reported, the package that we actually voted on on Saturday, which was voted down, the so-called original read plan, actually segregated out war funding to really defund the wars, which would have created about a trillion dollars in savings. Um, by the time we got to Monday, of course, the Republicans wanted to exempt the overseas contingency fund for funding the war, so that created no savings at all. There there were no revenues in the package at all, so that uh, the wealthiest 2 percent of Americans get to hold on to their money while the middle class and the poor uh, pay for it. And although, you know, some of the, the cuts that are planned for the next um, two-year uh, phase uh, kick in pretty much right away. And, you know, when you do these kind of across-the-board cuts, you can pretty much uh, consider that every program that affects every single community across this country is going to be affected from school nutrition programs to education uh, funding. It basically wiped out graduate student education funding at a time that the president says that we need to win uh, the future, but we can't do it without graduate students studying in all of those you know, science and technology fields and, in fact, could win the future. Uh, we didn't extend unemployment benefits, and so that's another fight that I suspect with these uh, Tea Partiers uh, governing things in Congress, we won't be able to do either. And so I just think it's a bad framework for the future, whether it was a $20 billion uh, cut uh, th to take effect this year or it was a trillion dollar, the framework that says that we can uh, cut government spending almost to the bare bones and raise no revenues whatsoever is really a bad deal for the American public. How did it happen in this way? 
I mean, uh, you had a journalist questioning President Obama last December. Um, when the whole issue of the tax breaks for the wealthy um, was uh, voted on, and saying, why haven't you attached this issue, that the uh, Tea Party Congress members are saying that they're going to take on? And he seemed to dis dismiss this. Let me go to a White House press conference in December. The Atlantic Magazine's contributing editor, Mark Ambinder, asked Obama about the Republicans' leverage to enact spending cuts by refusing to raise the debt limit. How do these negotiations affect negotiations or talks to Republicans about uh, raising the debt limit? Because it would seem um, that they have a significant amount of leverage over the White House now going in. Was there ever any attempt by the White House to include the raising the debt limit as part of this package? Uh, when you say that uh, it would seem they'll have a significant uh, amount of leverage over the White House, what do you mean? Just in the sense that, that you know, they'll say, essentially, we're not going to raise the, uh, the we're not going to agree to it unless the you know, White House is, is um, able to or willing to agree to significant spending cuts across the board that probably go deeper and further than what you're willing to do? Well, what lever I mean, what leverage would you have? Look, uh, you, you, here's my expectation, uh, and I'll take John Boehner at his word, that nobody, Democrat or Republican, uh, is willing to see the full faith and credit of the United States government uh, collapse. Well, that's exactly what actually took place until the very last minute, Congressmember Edwards. What happened? Well, I think no one could have imagined, even the president, that for the first time ever, I think it's something like well over a hundred times in our history that we've had a president and a Congress agree to raise the debt ceiling without conditioning it on these budget matters and budget fights. And I think no one could have imagined, um, even with the threats from this minority in the Republican Party, that they would have held hostage the entire United States uh, government and full faith and credit in the United States. Um, because of these budget concerns. And so I don't think the president was misplaced in December in thinking, well, how would anyone do that? It's never been done before. But sure enough, as we inch through the year, it's become clear that it's that minority element, the Tea Party element of the Republican Party, that's really driving a majority, the uh, majority in the, in the Congress. And uh, they were willing to go to a showdown. Now, we're you know, I've encouraged the White House and the president, at least, you know, publicly, is that I do think that we need to begin to play some hardball with these folks because uh, now they feel even more emboldened. And you can hear that from um, the remarks of Senator Mitch McConnell just in the last day that they that basically no one's going to be appointed to this uh, co joint select committee who will agree to raise revenues. And so already before the negotiation has even started, um, those revenue raisers have been taken off the table. There's no way that this can be a fair food fight. And I think that we need to play uh, a little bit more hardball with, the, with these folks and really take it to the American people, because in poll after poll, I mean, we hear, we know that the American public believes that those wealthiest 2 percent uh, need to pay their fair share and that they're not doing it. They also know that they've received those breaks for the last 10 years. And contrary to the Republican mantra, they are not job creators, because otherwise we would have created a lot of jobs. And so, um, you know, I'm one of those members members of Congress and Although I, you know, clearly I represent a progressive district, but I also think it's the voice of the American people that's saying we don't agree that the top two percent should just skate, while the rest of us, 98 percent, have to bear the entire burden of the government. And not just that, but the contributing factors to our long-term debt are those tax um, tax breaks for the wealthy, a prescription drug bill uh, from President Bush that was never paid for, and the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then you add to that a financial crisis that was brought along by the irresponsibility of the financial sector. The American public, middle class and poor people, are saying, wait a second, we didn't do any of that stuff. We haven't benefited from any of that stuff, and we shouldn't have to pay for it.
Uh, both the Progressive Caucus and the Congressional Black Caucus uh, were highly critical of the deal. The CBC urged President Obama to invoke the 14th Amendment, affirming the validity of the national debt as a means to bypass Congress. Speaking on the Senate floor, Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders also denounced the agreement backing the 14th Amendment proposal. The Constitution is very clear in saying that the debts of the United States, quote unquote, shall not be questioned. The president swears an oath to protect and defend the Constitution, and many constitutional scholars believe that the 14th Amendment gives the president the authority and responsibility to pay our debts regardless of the dysfunctionality of the U.S. Congress. Independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, Congress Member uh, Edwards, your response? Well, I joined uh, Jim Clyburn, um, uh, our, our uh, Democratic leader, in calling for the invocation of the 14th Amendment several weeks ago. And the reason is because, one, I think he does have the constitutional authority. And while there may be debate about that, I'll tell you one, one thing. Um, I think it's been said uh, that if the president had said, I'm going to pay Social Security checks, I'm going to pay our veterans, I'm going to pay our service members and their families, I'm going to meet our obligations, uh, the American public would have rallied behind behind that because uh, we know that it's important for the United States to meet its obligations. And I would have dared any of them to challenge him by impeachment or challenge him in the courts. And so, as I said, I believe in hardball. I've argued that uh, publicly, and I think it's time for uh, the White House to engage in that kind of hardball because uh, these folks obviously don't understand negotiation. They don't un understand compromise. They think compromise is a dirty word. And we have a lot of battles to fight in this uh, Congress, not the least of which is to get this economy rolling, to get people back in jobs. And now one wonders, where will we find the money uh, to rebuild our roads and our bridges and our wastewater system? Where will we find the money to make the investments in research and development and manufacturing that we need uh, for workers to get back to work in the 21st century with these kind of draconian cuts that are being placed on government? And keep in mind, that's a ripple effect. It is a cut in federal government, but that ripples down to our states and our localities, uh, virtually decimating government, which we know that for 30 years uh, these folks have made no secret of the fact that they want to completely decimate government. And this is just the beginning of that process. We're speaking with Democratic Congress member Donna Edwards of Maryland, a member of the Congressional Black Caucus and the Congressional Progressive Caucus. We're going to break, and when we come back, we're going to take on who is going to be making the next set of decisions. What is this super Congress or super committee of 12? How much transparency will there be? We'll also speak with Dean Baker, economist and co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back with them in a minute.